Recording in progress. So welcome back um, to the second session uh, today. We have three speakers, two of whom are with us at the moment, uh, and the third hopefully will arrive shortly. Um, this one, I, it was an, a kind of an adventure trying to um, make sessions that with papers that spoke to each or presentations that spoke to each other while also taking into consideration everybody's various time zones and uh, and so on but I kind of there seemed to be something about children and, uh, and and so on which following on from the discussion of the giraffe um, the giraffe poem was originally in this in this session uh, <laughs> but uh, but I then moved since uh, since Callista's on the east coast uh, I gave her the earlier start um, but uh, here we are, and I'm looking forward to hearing about Linus, the vegetarian T-Rex. Uh, Anastasia, do you want to uh, start us off? Yes, and I'm going to share my screen here. In some ways it kind of helps me that Laura is not here because my presentation is going to run a little long, but I'll try to keep you engaged. Um, so um, this past summer, on top of a grossly mismanaged pandemic, the state of North Dakota, where I live, also experienced a historical drought characterized by one rancher as the worst thing I can ever remember. Despite North Dakota's ranchers experiencing the driest 18 months in the state since modern record keeping began 126 years ago, they point to the variable nature of the climate here, where a dry year or two may be easily followed by a wet period instead of talking about climate change. Contemporaneous with the drought was the season of wildfires, which brought smoke from Canada, resulting in unhealthy air quality. For our family with a toddler at home over summer, this presented a tough dilemma, either go to indoor public spaces and risk contracting COVID-19 or go outside and risk respiratory disease. But how to explain to a three-year-old that we cannot safely go outside and that this is not just the variable nature of the climate here and rather part of a global climate crisis that will affect her far more than her parents as she inherits the damaged earth and the and from all the technocrats and the science deniers who auction off acres of national parks for fracking grounds and lay pipelines through indigenous tribal territories. I don't need to tell this group why we so desperately need to talk about and do something about the Anthropocene and the sixth mass extinction. But what do we talk about when we talk about the Anthropocene with children? And how do we do it without either scaring them with doomsday scenarios or pr promising them an unattainable magic bullet techno fix? I have two epigraphs for this talk. The first I borrow from Karen Malone's Children in the Anthropocene. But we are not all in the Anthropocene together, Malone writes, the poor and the dispossessed. The children and non-human animals are far more in it than others. I wanna focus on children and build on my own experience of raising a daughter in the age of climate crisis. And as Malone insists, it is children like her who have the most to lose. The second is, from uh, my own daughter. It's a song that she composed the morning after Halloween, along with her artwork. Before the asteroid hit the earth, there was T-Rexes, there was mommy T-Rex, there was baby T-Rex, and many little dinosaurs. The end. Boo. To this end, picture books about natural history museums can serve as conduits. These books often feature dinosaurs, thus feeding a dino obsession an intense conceptual interest among children ages four to six, which allows them to learn about the conceptual domain while also serving as a confidence booster. Conceptual interests or interests in conceptual domains motivate children to learn through books typically read to them by others, digital media, videotapes, and toys models that, that support them, which then promotes fact collecting. In other words, to children, dinos are huge, mysterious, exciting, and a word cool. Engaging children on a subject about which they are already passionate, dinos, can foster empathy across the species divide and introduce them to other less familiar notions like the climate crisis and the Anthropocene. One such book, Robert Neubecker's Line as the Vegetarian T-Rex, invites an animal studies um, comb feminist analysis. While feeding the conceptual dino fix, it challenges the human predilection toward using and consuming animal products, what Melanie Joy calls carnism, by reimagining the Tyrannosaurus rex as a vegetarian who befriends a human girl. This is important as meat eating contributes to global warming through methane, CO2, and nitrous oxide emissions. Again, I don't have to tell this group about that. The book also joins the feminist revisionist effort to reclaim the traditionally male dominated STEM fields that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics by making science relevant to girls. But 
its positive depiction of human animal friendship and a nod toward women in science education are offset by the questionable induction of the carnivorous T-Rex into the vegetarian club, as well as the book's employment of anthropomorphism and neoteny to make the titular dinosaur more relatable to kids. In this talk, then, I explore the cultural significance of dinosaurs in picture books to gauge whether and how they can help us start necessary conversations about the future of our planet with those most vulnerable and deeply impacted, the young readers of the Anthropocene. By focusing on Linus, I also ask whether this is the best book for the job. But why dinosaurs? The species whose name is colloquially associated with being outdated, obsolete because of failure to adapt and also extinct. I'm reminded of Timothy Morton's comments on Twitter, dinosaurs cost foot footprints and stuff. They lived for tens of millions of years. They're important. There isn't a dinosaur scene. Sorry, dinosaurs. I argue that dinosaurs can actually help us rewrite the history of the Anthropocene in a non-anthropocentric way by teaching kids that while humans may be the current apex predator, they are not the first and likely not the last. Dinosaurs can also teach kids and remind adults that we share our planet with other species whose survival and extinction are contingent upon human behavior and who may perish along with humans in a mass extinction event similar to that which ended the age of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs can help us tell a cautionary tale in which humans are at the same time the culprits in power and the victims powerless to forces larger than they are, global warming, flinging atmosphere, asteroids. Paleontologist Kenneth Lycavara concludes his 2016 TED Talk, Why Dinosaurs Matter, by asking that we recognize the extent of anthropogenic da um, damage done to the planet. You know, he says, we're all freaks of nature as species. We're not the recipients of some cosmic proclamation of manifest destiny, we got lucky. Reminding his audience that, this, that the asteroid wiped out not just the dinosaurs, but 75% of all species on Earth, Lycavara urges that humans, quote, not be the asteroid, end quote. Besides arousing excitement in kids then, um, however, any real conversation about dinosaurs entails tragedy and trauma potentially. So as not to become the asteroid, we need to talk about the asteroid. As Kristen Poling writes in an essay on Medium, learning about dinosaurs and the fifth mass extinction provided her son with his first encounter with death. Poling wonders whether his may not become a common experience, that of encountering the idea of death as a species event and only later is an individual experience and tragedy, at least among precariously privileged upper middle class American children who are introduced by their parents to the realities of mass extinction and climate change. By depicting a dinosaur who surprisingly comes to life, Robert Newbecker's Linus mollifies this blow, but it doesn't entirely write death out of the story, and I'll come back to that. So I hope you all had a chance um, to look at Newbecker's book and, and the reader, all 407 words of it. Just so that we're all on the same page, she's a very brief summary. Um, Linus opens with a young girl, Ruth Ann McKenzie, who proudly holds up her membership card to the Museum of Natural History. During her visit to this museum, Ruth Ann enters the Cretaceous Surprises exhibit where her favorite dinosaurs come to life. The first thing Ruth Ann says upon meeting Linus, a gigantic Tyrannosaurus rex is, please don't eat me. Along with the two rows of sharp teeth, the creature has kind green eyes, childlike short arms, stubby feet, all exemplifying neotenic traits that make him more relatable to human children. Identified by Conrad Lawrence, the cute response applies to animals with characteristically infantile traits, big round heads, small noses, chubby cheeks. As it is lunchtime, Linus asks the girl to join him and his predatorial identity is further dismantled through a reappropriation of the traditional rhetoric of hunting. The vegetarian dinosaur then attacked a patch of arugula, stalked some yummy broccoli and pounced on a plump tomato. When he greets rather than eats a herd of iguanodons, Ruth Ann exclaims, don't you want to eat those guys? And Linus replies, I wouldn't dream of it, they're my friends. Ruth Ann is understandably shocked when Linus denies his identity as a dinosaur who is fierce and a predator. He says instead that he's a very popular one. It is only when accosted by a band of velociraptors that Linus takes charge, picks up Ruth Ann, sets her atop of the tree, and proceeds to roar and roar and roar in all capitals. Even then, Linus objects to his actions being described as ferocious, insisting rather that he's just a big, very brave, and very vegetarian Tyrannosaurus rex. After an afternoon of veggies and all things Cretaceous, Ruth Ann steps through the curtain, purchases a stuffed T-Rex at the museum shop, and heads to the next exhibit. So in my analysis of Linus, I aim to produce what Peter Hunt calls a childist reading, 
Hunt, one of the founders of children's literature, claims that rereadings from a childist as opposed to an adultist point of view take into account personal, subcultural, experiential, and psychological differences between children and adults. For such a reading to be rewarding, Hunt explains, we have to challenge our assumptions, question every reaction, and ask what reading as a child really means. Children, for one, are orally based readers who are still learning reading strategies from adults, such as identifying with characters. This is further complicated by the fact that reading, like other interpretive strategies, is inevitably sex coded and gender inflected, as Anne Colony, uh, Annette Colony has noted. Perry Nodelman, um, another children's literature critic, reminds us that unlike adults, children are still learning hierarchical valuation. Who is at the center, who is named, and therefore who is important? Intriguingly, Nodelman writes, young children tend to scan a picture with equal attention to all parts. The ability to pick out and focus on the human at the center is therefore a learned activity and one that reinforces important cultural assumptions, not just about the relative value of particular objects, but also about the general assumption that objects do need to have different values and do therefore require different degrees of attention." End quote. Picture books that Linus typically, um, like Linus, typically contain simple verbal text, often accompanied by surprisingly complex visuals. The genre of picture books was developed based on popular assumptions about children having less access to complex written text. Therefore, written text for younger readers need the pictures to shadow them, meaning to show and tell all that the written words cannot say, as Norman argues in his book, The Hidden Adult. But words and pictures may be in tension with one another. As George Bodmer notes, the illustration offers a text in itself, which always tells a slightly different story. This distance between pictures and words may, may be the result of artistic differences between writers and illustrators, but a gap can exist in the case of the writer and illustrator being the same person, as is starkly evident in artist writers like Maurice Sendak and Dr. Seuss. In the case of Newbecker, he's both the artist and the writer as well. Ironic differences between words and pictures emerge in my adultist, sorry, in my childist reading of Linus, thus supporting Bodmer's and Nodelman's observations. The text is only 407 words long, that's like 10 average tweets, but a total of 38 pages, not counting the type, title page. My summary was limited mostly to the verbal, but more is revealed when examining these illustrations, particularly with the assistance of my child co-researcher. Unlike me, whose attention is immediately drawn to the titular dinosaur, my daughter notices another small dinosaur on the same page, whom she compares to a frog, a detail that escaped me during multiple readings. She also questions the identity of the velociraptors hiding in the bushes, another detail that I had ignored. She is drawn to the animal rather than human protagonist, which is an important step in combating anthropocentrist readings, but also a testament to the power of neoteny and anthropomorphism to which I shall return. By contrast, I identify with the human girl and pick up on Ruth Ann's status as dinosaur expert, uh, which is being ironically undermined. While according to the text, she knew all about the ice age, she knew all about the oceans. The illustration adds to this dimension of the know-it-all and the kind of eagerness to teach others that may not be welcomed by adult museum goers. More intriguing to me is my daughter's reaction to the page with the reconstructed dinosaur bones. She asks, why are the dinosaurs like skeletons? She has asked the same question at least twice. Because they lived a long, long time ago, I explain. Are the dinosaurs alive today, I ask her? No, she replies, do you like dinosaurs? Yes, I think I have a triceratops. And indeed she does um, have uh, plastic and, and stuffed toys. We have not yet had a serious conversation about death, as in Poling's case. This is my child's indeed first encounter with death through dinosaur skeletons. It has already included some follow-up chats about what an asteroid is and what it means for dinosaurs to disappear. Children's literature critics find that animal characters in books can help kids work through serious issues like death. Carolyn Burke and Joby Copenhaver suggest that anthropomorphic animals can add a degree of emotional distance for the reader, writer, speaker, when the story message is very powerful, personal, and painful. Animal suffering and death is a standard fictional device often used didactically by writers. I have commented on the speciesist as underpinnings of that elsewhere. The problem is that this is an exceptional stance that must be transformed into an opportunity to challenge human exceptionalism. We can more openly depict and talk about dinosaur death because dinosaurs are not human and provide the necessary intellectual and emotional distance. However, we must then do this in a way that helps kids learn about the precarity of life, not just for dinosaurs or humans, but for 
all living species around us. In this regard, then, Linus's curious identity as a vegetarian becomes at once a helpful tool for initiating conversations about sustainability and being historically false, also a scientific liability. In other words, Linus the Vegetarian T-Rex promotes vegetarianism among kids by mobilizing the appeal of dinosaurs, but it also misrepresents T-Rexes as herbivores, potentially leading young readers to question the reliability of all representation in picture books. Nodelman finds ironies in children's books to be learning opportunities that, quote, can turn young readers into semioticians, end quote. The more both adults and children realize the degree, he says, to which all representations misrepresent the world, the less likely they will be to confuse any particular representation with reality or to be unconsciously influenced by ideologies they have not considered. Although this may be beneficial for kids' critical thinking evolving over time, I argue, it might not carry the specific message about sustainability that is more urgent. To put this differently, can an unreal dinosaur effectively communicate a real message? Incidentally, my three-year-old already knows that T-Rexes are mean and that can bite, so she's not deceived by this friendliness that Linus puts on. So why Linus? Why of all the dinosaur books out there did I select Linus? This is a question one reviewer raised in my manuscript on vegan children's literature. But when the editors of Fair Society asked me to recommend a children's book about positive human-animal relationship, of relationships, I thought of Linus. When confirming the receipt of my workshop proposal, Curry described it as a wild book, and it is, it's a wild book. What might have motivated Newbecker to recast an archetypal meat eater as an herbivore rather than focus on any of the diverse and equally intriguing plant eaters like Stegosaurus, Triceratops, Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, Ankylosaurus? After all, there are ways to make plant eating dinosaurs exciting, as in Sorry, this Wesley Community Children's Center programming rife with children-centric appeals and exclamation points. Newbecker misrepresents the carnivorous T-Rex as a vegetarian who eats a vegan lunch and is featured on the cover happily chomping a carrot. The dust jacket mentions that the author was inspired to write this story after reading about the Falcarius utahensis, a dinosaur whose ancestors evolved from being meat eaters to vegetarians. 2015, the Chilean, um, a set of Chilean scientists discovered the Chiliosaurus Diego Suarezi, an unusual herbivorous theropod. But neither of these is a T Rex, right? One of the primary reasons for writers of children's literature to include animals, according to Margaret Blount, who is referenced in almost any discussion of children's literature, is, quote, to help our nature study along, end quote. However, one study finds that anthropomorphic depictions of animals lead not only to children acquiring scientifically inaccurate knowledge, but also to them adopting an anthropocentric view of the world. So again, are we okay with a human-like plant-eating T-Rex making vegetarianism cool for kids? The book's message is, moreover, somewhat unclear. One reviewer puts it, children may have a hard time determining what lesson they're to take from this. Are they meant to learn that vegetarianism doesn't make you a wimp or that it will um, win them hordes of adoring friends and fans or just not to make assumptions? Another reviewer comments that the visual tastiness of these pages compensates for the slight story. Despite these less than rave reviews, the book appears in second place among Choose Veg's children's books with a vegan message. It is seventh in the list of vegan children's books which share the same core, animals are our equals. According to the World of Vegan blog, it is sixth in Live Kindly's list of children's book that, books that teach values of compassion and love for all. So despite its blatant anthropomorphism, Newbecker's Linus instills the love of natural history museums while also promoting science to girls, adding to a growing corpus of feminist children's literature on STEM. By aligning vegetarianism with fierce and ferocious dinosaurs, the book also dispels the cultural association between plant-based diets and physical weakness. There are some limitations, though, and serious ones. In addition to its misleading claim about T-Rexes, Linus can also be critiqued for being white, urban, elitist. Ruth Ann McKenzie is a recognizably Anglo-Saxon Scottish name. Museums tend to be located in cities with the museum on Linus's cover evoking the facade of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. The, and vegetarianism, especially veganism, is culturally associated with white upper middle class culture. 
There's also an issue of access. Museum memberships are typically not free in the United States. Additionally, like much of vegan children's authors, Newbecker uses an anthropomorphic cute dinosaur to promote dietary choices rather than a more comprehensive understanding of vegan and vegetarian values. These are precisely the limitations of the genre noted by Matthew Cole and Kate Stewart in their book, Our Children and Other Animals, namely drawing on already existing problematic human other animal relations, such as pet keeping and cute style, and anti-vegan discourse, such as reduction of veganism to an issue of dietary practice. At the same time, museums are not only urban phenomena. Initiatives like the Museum on Main Street, the Smithsonian Institution's Traveling Exhibition Service, um, aim to bring museum exhibitions and educational resources to small towns. So Linus can encourage kids in these areas to visit traveling exhibits. Further initiatives like the Sista Vegan Project started by A. Breeze Harper mean to challenge white veganism and gatekeeping, including the claim that plant-based diets are expensive and thus inaccessible to middle-class folks in and outside of urban centers. This is not to deny the existence of fresh food deserts in many parts of the United States that make access to vegan and vegetarian diets inequitable for BIPOC communities. Alanis features folks of color and does not demand high-end vegan options, though, while putting to use the rhetoric of predator prey to make the more ethical consumption of veggies less boring for kids. So for any change to happen, child readers first have to relate to the characters in their books. A child will likely identify with Linus through his anthropomorphic depiction, which is kind of an unnecessary evil. Although not as anthropocentrist as other Dino books, and arguably an example of weak anthropomorphism, Linus still heavily draws on the tradition of anthropomorphic depiction of animals that risks reducing them to metaphors for human behavior, and thus, as I show in my other work, contributes to the pernicious instrumentalizing of non-human animals. To give you a sense of what I would deem strong anthropomorphism, here are some books in which dinosaurs are effectively humans in dino suits who teach human children human lessons. Dinosaur Dig, for example, is a vibrantly colored alliterative counting book for children ages two to six where dinosaurs dig, roll, scrape, and spray paint to make their own pool. Do dinosaurs play with their friends? Is one book in a series with others like How Do Dinosaurs Say Goodnight? How Do Dinosaurs Eat Their Food? And How Do Dinosaurs Learn Colors? Uh, Dinosaur Kisses features Dinah, the baby dinosaur, who learns how to be more gentle to other animals. She ends up stomping, chomping, and eating most of them. This is obviously not an exhaustive list, but it'll give you an idea. Other children's books set in natural history museums, which I do not have the time to consider, are Maisie Goes to the Museum, where an anthropomorphic albino rat and her animal friends spend a rainy day looking at a large T-Rex skeleton and egg. Harry and the Dinosaurs at the Museum, which tells of a young boy with a bucket full of dinosaurs who come to life while he completely, uh, while he completes a surprisingly not boring school assignment about Roman history. The Dinosaur Museum, which describes a class field trip to a dinosaur museum that allows two boys to bond over their shared fear of dinosaurs. And a funny thing happened at the museum, which follows the protagonist's naughty intrusion into museum culture with dinosaur bones getting dislodged and scattered. The latter also features a woolly mammoth unseemly decorated with pink ribbons for the kids' enjoyment. Not all books about dinosaurs are anthropomorphic though. My Big Dinosaur Book and the Pretty Book series presents fun facts about various dinosaur types, like which dinosaur has stripes, along with visually stimulating images of three-dimensional dinosaur models. Similarly, an activity book like Build Your Own Dinosaurs from the mid-90s does not feature anthropomorphic animals. It does teach children about seven types of dinosaur, and it encourages them to play paleontologists by using the rubber stamps with this book to assemble their own dinosaurs and make their own dinosaur museum. The book thus reinforces the privileged position of the human over the non-human by giving the former the power to select whom and how to assemble and enliven. But it also provides an opportunity to reflect on how current paleontologists study the history of various species on Earth and how future scientists, perhaps from a different planet, might be tasked with similar assemblages to recreate human skeletons. When reading Build Your Own Dinosaurs from an ecofeminist and human animal perspective, however, certain ideological underpinnings are also revealed. While of the seven types of dinosaur, only two are carnivorous, T-Rex and Velociraptor, these are also the first two featured, with descriptions highlighting their ferocious teeth, comparing the special ridges of the T-Rex's seven-inch long curved teeth to a steak knife used to cut through the thick skin of its prey. 
The Velociraptor's front claws acted like hooks to cling to its prey, while their rear claws sliced it open. Such rhetoric of cutting, slicing, steak knife, prey evokes violence and power. By contrast, the Paraceratophus, who comes in fifth, is described as having a duck bill, a mouth with no teeth, similar to that of a duck. The illustrations also tell a gendered story. The two meat eater skeletons have boys and adult males standing next to them. All but one of the plant eaters have girls and their guardians, even one little baby girl in a pink dress next to the Stegosaurus. The Ankylosaurus features a boy and his father, both folks of color. This attempt at gender neutral multiculturalism seems to suggest that while both boys and girls are into dinosaurs, there's a gendered and perhaps also a racial dimension to which dinos they do or should prefer. So I wanna conclude by posing a series of questions. Are we willing to forgive Linus' shortcomings as a book because of its positive message or multiple messages, promoting a friendly human-animal relationship and ethical vegetarianism, foregrounding women in science education and celebrating natural history museums? Is Linus the right dino for this kind of work? Are there other children's books that more effectively combine elements of veganism and vegetarianism with some discussion of the climate crisis? Those books more powerfully speak to kids on an individual human level while also teaching them about broader concerns, both human and non-human. And finally, what should we talk about? This one's a doozy. When we talk about the Anthropocene to children, is the focus on extinction simply too grim for naive readers? And what's the alternative? If we focus on cool dinosaur lives and neglect their deaths, are we missing a valuable opportunity to introduce notions of precarity, humility, and ultimately transformation? Um, and I have some answers to these questions, but but I'd like to now hear from you. Thank you. Um, would you like me to take down the questions or go, go ahead, Margaret? Um, this has the most to do with the first question. I'm not sure if it answers it, but um, something that sort of stood out to me um, in reading the book was the way the velociraptors are being portrayed. Um, and I think that there is a really different way of reading this book sort of anthropomorphically or, or zoomorphically. Um, because I think if you if you sort of read the dinosaurs anthropomorphically, it, it's saying one thing about vegetarianism. Um, but if you sort of read it zoomorphically where the dinosaurs are standing in for animals, it's saying something about um, how like herbivores are, are a better kind of animal than carnivores almost. The velociraptors are really, um, sort of negatively portrayed, um, which I think would connect really interestingly with the, um, with the presentation on wolves. I'm not sure if we'll, we'll end up discussing the wolves, but um, like if wolves are represented in this book, I think that they're there as the velociraptor. Um, so I'm interested in thinking about that, um, how this is saying one thing about how to treat animals in terms of vegetarianism and our own diets, but then maybe saying something else about how we should treat um, carnivores, which are sort of other predator animals are um, often very negatively treated by humans. Um, so that's an interesting tension there, I think, and maybe one of the other drawbacks in, in the message in the book. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, and also suggesting um, I, I just taught Henry Lewis um, Jr. Gates as signifying um, that like signifying or like yelling or insulting is like a better way to deal with a predator than is eating them. Um, so I think that but by roaring, although in this exaggerated right um, way in all capital letters, um, the, the, that's more of a pacifist and um, non-aggressive way of dealing with your enemies or dealing with the vilified other. Um, so that's that's interesting. I'll, and and as I mentioned, I I, I noticed the velociraptors be, because they are lurking, but but it took me several reads, whereas my daughter immediately picked up on it. Um, that was that was a fascinating detail to me. 
that um, this, this notion that children are not yet socialized into these reading strategies. So, um, so their reading will be different, right? that her eye is not immediately drawn um, to Linus, although there are other competing factors like his neoteny that, that makes, it re makes him really relatable. So thank you for that. Um, Gail, it looks like you have a question. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess I wanted to have a question about how you feel about the unreliable narrator in terms of the T-Rex and the kind of ambivalence that that introduces. And it reminded me of, um, you know, that character in Finding Nemo, uh, Bruce the shark, who announces he's a vegetarian. And, um, you know, there's always this in, in, I mean, in that sense, I think that Finding Nemo is uh, more about poking fun at the idea of vegetarianism in a way, but Bruce is, um, you know, he's kind of a uh, well-meaning but scary character, you know, like, um, so he, his, the threat of Bruce is not really resolved in, in a way in Finding Nemo. Um, and, and so I guess kind of interested in that figure of the unreliable narrator, and it also reminds me of the, the fable of the, you know, the scorpion that wants a lift across the river. Um, so the, there's those kind of uh, interesting things. And, and it um, made me think of one book that we had, uh, well, that my, my kids really found intriguing and was probably the, you know, the one of the more confronting children's books we had in the house. And it was called um, When Hunger Calls. And I think I, I can't remember the name of the author, but it was a picture book and each sort of spread was like a different animal and, and uh, how it killed and eat, ate its food. And so that was an interesting kind of question there about uh, a different kind of ethical question around um, food, which isn't just, you know, I guess it, it, it's playing more to the question about diversity of diet and how we respect diversity of diet. So that, that are my kind of two questions in it with relation to, to, you know, an ethics of food that um, can deal with cultural difference and, and deal with different kinds of approaches to diet and the kind of idea of the, the carnivore um, kind of vegetarian um, a, as an unreliable narrator. But, one more thing that I think is, is a fascinating fact, but is that the uh, panda bear is, um, you know, in classified as a carnivore, um, and uh, apparently it has the same digestive tract. And it's an absolutely fascinating story about how carnivores actually, uh, this carnivorous bear actually becomes a vegetarian. So there is actually this genuine story about um, a carnivore who, you know. I don't know how long ago, but a million years ago, decides to eat bamboo. Um, so there's a, there is actually a, and is still classified as a carnivore. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've written down the titles that you suggested. And I'm just trying to also like chew it over. Um, as as you point out, some of the some of some of this food for for thought. Um, so this won't answer it, but but maybe it'll it'll start um, at addressing some of what you said. Um, I came across this book originally when I was um, writing about anthropomorphism in children's books and and taking a, a rather uncompromising look at at how negative um, the ultimate results of anthropomorphizing um, animals for children are, and then ultimately treats them as means to an end and, and, and um, instrumentalizes animals without necessarily trying to police or censor what sort of books we should read to our children because so many of them feature animals by pointing some of those problematics out. Um, that led me to vegan children's literature. So I wanted to see, well, if not Three Blind Mice or The Rainbow Fish, which is just a horrific book about like descaling, right, to, to gain friends. Um, which is supposed to be about sharing. But um, so if not those books or Alueta, which is about plucking your feathers and anyway. Um, so if not that those books, like what are some books that, um, that do promote unethical treatment of animals? Um, so I came across the work of Ruby Roth um, and the ways that she sort of foregrounds um, animal lives in the factory farm, often juxtaposing images of, of wild animals um, roaming freely and playing happily with more 
poignant sort of horrific snapshots of animals in cages, uh, disabled with broken necks, you know, trying to escape. Um, so, so Linus was 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 a book that did not foreground violence in, in, in such ways, because one of the issues that arose for me is, am I introducing my child to violence for a good cause? But am I traumatizing my kid, right, to promote an ethical treatment of animals? Is this violence really necessary, right? So, or at least for a three-year-old. Um, so Linus seemed like a book that could introduce those ideas of, of human-animal relationships without that violence. But, but, but you're, I think, what you're getting is like that uh, both of you that the violence is there right um and that maybe by making him a carnivorous herbivore it's like redirecting our gaze but like there is a way in which children have to even children who love animals have to accept ultimately that there is brutality in, in the natural world right and 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 animals eat out of an, uh, other animals even if we as humans have decided not to um so, um, so, so in that sense, I mean, I, again, I feel like Linus is this like ambiguous figure. On the one hand, um, promoting the ethical points of view towards animals. On the other hand, also doing a disservice by misrepresenting real historical dinosaurs and 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 their realities. So yeah, I'm, st I'm still processing, but, but, but I, I, I appreciate all those comments. Uh, Julita? Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I have a four-year-old daughter and I am vegan and she's so curious now about my lifestyle. I'm not gonna call it diet. And um, I'm not forcing anything because I'm raising her with her father. So he's not vegan. So we're, she is eating animals. Um, to, to the example of dinosaurs, um, I know kids are so interested in dinosaurs, but my child is not that fascinated by their stories. So to me, introducing this um, vegetarian T-Rex wouldn't resonate anything with her. And I think for the children, being um, familiar with dinosaurs is just that they don't exist anymore. So they just form it in a way like how you also described like uh, childish figures that they are their toys and they cannot visualize how they big they were or what they were doing. So I, my question was about the book of uh, Ruby Rose that uh, you were just mentioning to what extent it is violent because she's my daughter is like living in bubble now. We are we have uh, in the Netherlands those uh, child farms that you can go and play with them farm animals and you can see that uh, behind the cows it says like cows give us milk cows give us meat they give we don't take it so there's some education going on in there so she's with animals but i want to at some point that bubble is going to be broken because she's eating nuggets now for example she's saying that i'm eating nuggets i'm like you're eating chicken she's like this is nuggets so she doesn't have that uh, correlation between, of course, it, the time will come, I think, next year or so. So to what extent this book is violent to break that bubble? Because I don't want to tell her that this is that we're, people are eating animals. I want to tell her that people are eating animals and exploiting them, but in a way that it is a lifestyle. So it's not just a diet that we're doing. So about the right. Um, I recommend exploring her work, um, especially since vegan children's literature tends to be not mainstream. Um, and in another talk, I actually looked at sort of the Amazon ranking and Rainbow Fish, Feister's book, ranks at 243, and Ruby Ross books rank at 20,000. 243. I mean, it's like just staggering and in which ways that they're marginalized um, because of the countercultural subject matter. Um, so she has a book called V's for Vegan. Um, it's, it's an alphabet book um, that goes through the alphabet, obviously, um, and, and points out certain ways that, you know, we don't um, capture insects in jars. Um, and it features a caged lion. So those are the, the two images that implicitly um, sort of um, engage with animal violence. Um, it also opens with a with a boy kind of um, mouth 
escape um, over a chicken saying animals are our friends, we don't eat our friends. Um, so, so that book I've read to my three-year-old. Um, there's another book, that's why we don't eat animals. That's the book that I was referencing. Um, and that's the book that's actually been criticized um, as sort of like scaring children's into, children into veganism. Um, that's the book that juxtaposes those images. Um, I have, I think I have it at the office, otherwise I'd, I'd show you, but, but you, can, you can Google Ruby Roths, that's why we don't eat animals. Um, and she goes through all the different um, animal species, um, starting with farmed animals. Um, and she really does have a preference for farmed animals. Um, so you would have a, a family of turkeys who are playing in the wild and uh, on a uh, facing page, you would have those same turkeys in cages and, and trying to break through with their feathers, you know, kind of flying. Um, and she has another image um, of a desert where all the animals are kind of clinging to each other in the dark as they try to face climate crisis. So there's still more of an emphasis on, on the factory farming um, treatment of animals, but there is sort of a, a larger knot to the climate crisis, but it's kind of later on in the book. And it's funny you should mention chicken nuggets because there's also a children's literature book called Not a Nugget that that's precisely the same. Here are some chickens playing. They also like to play ball like children do, not a nugget, right? Um, and it goes through again, like animal species pointing out, not a hamburger, not mm -hmm. soap. I mean, you know, so so those again, I read as kind of implicit evocations of, of animal slaughter, but they're a little bit more um, nuanced. Um, another book is Stephen the Vegan that makes the same kind of argument. And it's said at lunchtime, um, and they go to an animal um, sanctuary and the Stephen vegan points out to all of his friends, you know, um, that uh, pork it actually comes from a pig and, and things like that. But all of these books have a dietary focus. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, could I ask a, 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 a pretty ignorant question about the trajectory of uh, children's books that are trying to reach children on ethical issues? Um, I wondered if you have a sense of whether the books you're focused on um, tend to, uh, to the, tend to be concerned with not affecting a young reader so much as to like really disturb them in the way I think of Black Beauty was just, someone read that to me aloud when I was little and I still haven't recovered. Or even um, someone earlier mentioned the Lorax. I think a lot of Dr. Zeus is really, really upsetting for readers of a bunch of different ages. Um, but the, the just looking at the titles that you um, went over in your talk, I, I, these books seems to, to avoid that in general, would that be right? Um, I totally commiserate and I've actually written on other books um, that feature animal death um, and, and have been traumatizing me ever since I was a child. Um, vegan children's literature, I mean, it, in many ways, it's, sort of, it's polemical, right? And it's, um, so I, I, I find some books like Ruby Roth's exposing the ills of factory farming, but I also found find a lot of those books trying to um, narrate a positive experiences, particularly of, of rescued animals like Sprig, the rescue pig is another good one. Um, but, but I could also see those picture books being traumatizing to certain um, kids as well. I mean, for example, the, the picture of the lion in a cage was, was traumatizing to my child. It's something that, that I tried to kind of move very quickly past it. Um, uh, so, I mean, those, as a parent, the, the, those, those places of, of potential trauma are, are, are problematic for me, right? I, I don't want to have her end up in therapy for the rest of her life, but like as an animal scholar, right? I also find those to be the loci for the kind of productive work. Um, so maybe it's also a question of um, age. Um, and I think maybe a three-year-old is too young, but a six-year-old maybe is, is, a, is a little bit more kind of mature. But, but to me, the question is like, when is it too late, right, to try to intervene and in, 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 in challenging anthroparchy by the, by the point where like she's become, going to become socialized, right, um, into sort of accepting and normalizing the exploitation and slaughter of animals. So I don't know what the answer is. I keep asking.
Oh, I see two more hands and then maybe Kyrie, oh, I should probably give the mic. Um, Gail, is that an old hand maybe? Or is that a new one? Then <laughs> maybe Meryl. Yeah, um, very interesting, all of this, especially because um, I'm getting closer to writing my, my master's thesis and I want to write uh, about the representation of farm animals. Um, and I'm, I would like to do a chapter on children's literature, so this is real, very exciting. But um, I was looking at uh, Ruby Roth's books, um, especially that's why we don't eat animals. And I'm quite interested that her visual representations of the animals aren't uh, still aren't very realistic. They're not cute in the usual sense, but they are still quite cute. So the chicken is a, just a circle with two feet, right? It's very cool. Um, but I wonder if you could say anything about that, um, that in that sense, it's still, supposed to be cute or attractive and not realistic Thank yeah you. And, yeah and the book that i referenced that would be a good book for you um is our, our children and other animals um they have a discussion of her illustration style so yes those images um are are not naturalistic um she tends to have sort of elongated necks and and exaggerated large heads um but 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 uh, but they read it, um, Cole and Stewart, as still uh, examples of cute style. And I think I agree. It's a kind of grotesque cute, but it's still one that kind of fetishizes, right? But but in a different way. Instead of the chubby cheeks, you have the the elongated necks. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a. I I have a preference. I mean, for for honestly some some photographic books that include more naturalistic representations of animals that, that might still be anthropomorphized through narration but at the very least you know it, it reduces that anthropomorphic quality all right um Kyle, are you going to take one last question from Powell and then i'll seed thank you yeah hi thank you interesting talk something which i never thought about sort of uh or which is always there but which I hadn't really considered as sort of also, of course, influencing all of us at some point in our lives. And I was also like I was saying, uh, when I was younger or when I was a child, I had a, a book and it was called The Robot, or at least in English, it's called The Robot Zoo. And it sort of explained the, wor the inner workings of animals um, by making them sort of these mechanic beings. So, for instance, the 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 fly had like a, a hoover for a snout, and the mole had sort of these shovels, which he used as. But and and also, I think they also sort of showed how they would digest food, but then it would be oil or coal or, and that, it made me sort of think about sort of the <laughs> sort of the other side of, sort of, um, because of course sort of the the the, the point we're talking about now is sort of how to create awareness but and this book is from I think 1994 or something that's when it was first published but sort of I'm also sort of wondering about the other side sort of these implicit messages that are sort of conveyed through because yeah it's it they're very sort of an anatomical anatomically correct depictions of animals but then in a mechanical sense so it's kind of yeah I sorry I don't there's not really a question but it's more sort of a Make me re wonder, sort of the the the, the, the yeah, to what extent like the uh, the expansiveness of this uh, this concept sort of uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, that was I, a bit of a ramble. But... No, I thank you very much because I'm 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 creating a, cr a critical theory um, seminar to teach in the spring, and I was looking for a children's text that includes cyborgism because I ah. want. You know, to include Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto and the Companion Manifesto, and talk about some of those developments in her work. Um, so this sounds like a fascinating way to explore the other um, in this way, in this kind of intersectional way. Um, and, and of course, that harks back to sort of the mechanistic view of animals. Um, uh, so yeah. yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, it puts forth yeah. sort of this whole new dichotomy, which it's really weird. Like, uh, it's in some ways ushering in, you know, uh, very traditional ideas about, about about animals, but also bring them to the twenty first century. So that's yeah, that's fascinating. And um, Zoe Jacks has a uh, has a book on the post human and animals. So um, so I wonder if she examines that. Interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you. Um, if there are yeah. some comments, I'll look at them. Thank you again. Okay. Um, thank you, Anastasia, and uh, all the commenter commentators. Um, I think we have to uh, move on. There's still no sign of Laura. So um, we will give the floor to Margaret. Uh, and I'm very curious to hear about your, uh, your lioness. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to also share my screen. Okay. So I have a very sort of brief presentation, um, just sort of introducing my research and the materials. Um, and then I'm hoping there will be a lot for us all to talk about together um, with these Lion articles. Okay. So first, um, my research focuses on human animal performances in US zoos in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and I'm particularly interested in thinking about um, the way these performances are becoming sort of forums for um, expressing and sort of articulating and negotiating um, definitions of, of race, gender, and species, and the sort of relationships between those categories um, and the hierarchies between them. Um, so I'm looking at things like the <laughs> dogs nursing the lions, but then also um, zookeepers force feeding snakes and um, going into cages to kind of tussle with um, animals like lions and bears. Um, so this is where my interest in the dogs nursing lions comes from. I'm really interested in the things it's saying about gender and sort of the relationships um, between species, but I'm also really interested to hear what um, everyone else <laughs> thinks about them. Uh, so the articles that I've brought are from, they're focused on Chicago's Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, the Lincoln Park Zoo sort of grew haphazardly in the late 19th century. Um, it started with a pair of swans that were donated to the zoo in 1868. And then a kind of animal collection was built up from there and eventually formalized into the zoo. Um, it was always free and open to the public because it was part of Lincoln Park, this park on the North shore of Chicago, um, right by the lakefront. Um, and it was, uh, administered by the park board. So it was sort of subsidiary under the park. Um, these two images are from the lion house, the new lion house that was built in 1912. Um, so it's a little bit after the articles I've shared, but um, any cubs in those articles that weren't sold to circuses or to other zoos um, would have maybe ended up living in this lion house. So um, I also want to introduce the sort of key figures who are coming up in these articles. Um, first is Cyrus DeVry. Um, and he is um, often described as the first head keeper or the first director of Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, but he didn't start working there until 1888. Um, so he's there 20 years after the swans. Um, and he plays a big role in sort of that process of turning uh, the sort of haphazard collection of animals into something that's more formally presenting itself as a zoo. Um, and I'm interested in him because he is a very um, big character. He's involved in a lot of these animal, human animal performances. Um, and he has a really close, interesting relationship with the media. Um, and he always seems to, in all of his um, interactions with animals, he always manages to sort of use them to advertise um, his own kind of manliness. Um, so that's Cyrus DeVry and he's mentioned in the articles that I shared. Um, and then the other sort of main figure who's mentioned in those articles is this lion named Emma Ames. Um, her life is a lot more difficult to trace because um, the newspaper articles that mention her are really inconsistent with one another. Um, but she's this lion at Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, she's named after this famous opera singer, Emma Ames. So she's, um, her name is sort of evidence of the way DeVry um, is <laughs> taking any opportunity he can to sort of 
promote the zoo and create um, create publicity. Um, the earliest mention I've seen of her is in 1895. There's a mention of a two-year-old cub named Emma Ames. And then the latest mention I've seen of her is in 1913, um, which is just a few years after the articles I've shared. So I'm not sure um, exactly what ended up happening with her. Um, this image is from 1905 and it's not, the label for it does not identify who these lines are. So um, this could have been Emma Ames, but it also could have been another lion in the collection. So um, I just want to briefly introduce the articles I've talked about, but I don't want to say too much about them now um, because I'm hoping we can all discuss them. Um, so I shared three articles, two from 1908 and one from 1911. Um, and these sort of represent the ends of this period when the Chicago Tribune was reporting very frequently on um, instances where dogs were being used to nurse lion cubs. Um, so the, the earliest examples I found were in 1908 and the latest examples were in 1911. Um, but in that date range, um, I found 11 articles describing or talking about dogs nursing lion cubs. Um, and those articles describe six different lion litters. So there's usually two articles for every litter um, one sort of announcing that a lioness is refusing to nurse her cubs and that the zoo needs a dog. And then one usually announcing that they, they have found the dog and um, how wonderful that is. So um, two of those articles have photos. One of them I shared with the materials I sent and then the, um, the other image here is from another dog that was used to nurse lions. Um, I want to focus on the articles I did share, um, but I will mention a couple of details from other articles. Um, one is an article from 1911, earlier in the year, um, where Cyrus DeBry talks about how much he hates bottle feeding these dogs. Um, so that's one way that I'm interested in thinking about um, the dogs nursing lions is that um, they're sort of allowing the zookeepers like Cyrus DeBry to displace this more feminized care work that they're that he's saying that he hates um, onto this other animal, onto the dogs. So it's kind of in some ways maybe contributing to the way he's presenting himself as, as very masculine, um, that it's more appropriate for these female dogs to do that work. Um, and that's also part of why I chose this image of him to share. Um, even when he does, <laughs> pose for publicity photos, um, nursing an animal, um, he sits in this really ridiculous way where his legs are very spread apart. Yeah, he also has a cigar in his mouth in every photograph of him that I've seen. Um, but he's really, you know, sitting leg spread in a way that's um, kind of revealing in the, the pants that he's wearing. So, um, there's ways where even when he's talking about doing this care work, he's sort of reminding you that how masculine he is. Um, and then um, I'm also really interested in thinking about the ways that the dogs are being portrayed relative to the lions. Um, so it's kind of similar to the children's books we were just talking about. These are really anthropomorphized rep representations of animals. Um, but, but rather than being sort of fictional characters, um, they are talking about real animals. Um, and so I'm interested in thinking about that disconnect between these animals and their representations, um, but then also the way the really highly gendered descriptions of the dogs and the lions are sort of becoming a way for the Chicago Tribune to maybe enforce <laughs> these very particular roles for women where the lioness is being really vilified, especially in that last article um, for the way that she's neglecting her cubs as compared with these um, good mothering dogs who are coming in and saving the day. Um, I think I'm gonna maybe stop there and hopefully we can talk about the articles. I've listed other points of interest. 
um, in the materials I submitted. Um, I will just mention one other detail from the articles, which I didn't mention um, in the materials I sent, which is that um, a really sort of upsetting <laughs> detail of this article um, is in this anthropomorphized conversation between the other zoo animals about the dog that's come to nurse the lions. Um, there's this sort of very matter of fact information we get supposedly from a coyote um, that the dogs, the dog was available to nurse these lions because her puppies were drowned in a tub of water. Um, so that's another sort of strange tension here is that um, the dog is being elevated over the lioness in some ways because she's um, treating this cubs in this more appropriate way. Um, but also the lion cubs are being really elevated over her cubs. Um, we need to save one and we don't really care about the other ones who have um, been drowned. Um, but I think I want to hopefully open it up to conversation very early. I'm really interested to hear um, what everyone else thought about these materials. So Asaf and Kari. Thank you very much. I since you you uh, put your finger on exactly the point that I wanted to um, talk about. Um, my notes uh, it, uh, on these articles consist mostly of a series of increasingly um, outsized exclamation marks in the margins at just the kind of unbelievable aspects of the of this and this the, the casualness with which the her, the pups have been drowned um really stood out for me as uh, especially in you know as a, a very jarring detail given the kind of jaunty anthropomorphized uh, you know animals are telling the story uh style of this of this piece which you know is hard to think of as Journalism, you know, I don't know, right? That there's, there's just so everything is wrong with this, with the, particularly, the, particularly this article. It was, uh, it was a, it was a very disconcerting reading experience for me. Um, but just now, I don't really have a question other than that. Thank you for bringing all, bringing this, this material um, to us. But just now, you, you seem to suggest that, that the pups had been drowned so that she could go and nurse these lion cubs. But I wonder if it wasn't just a common practice to drown pups anyway, and that therefore you had these lactating uh, dogs around. Uh, and so it happened to be that, that a reader uh, had one and would have drowned the pups anyway. Yeah, I think that that's a definite possibility. Um... I just it's it's um, seems notable to me that the whether or not um, the pups were drowned so that she would be available. Um, she, this dog is available and, and lactating because she did have puppies that she doesn't have anymore because they were drowned um, and the the circumstances um, for some of the other dogs that are, are mentioned are not always described. Sometimes it says that she's lost her puppies. There's at least one other um, that mentions the dogs, the puppies being drowned. Um, so I think, yeah, it is very possible that that was a common practice for puppies. And um, that's why part of why they were able to do this. Um, and they always did get a lot of dog volunteers, it seems like. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you also pointed to the beginning of that article where the really strange conversation is happening between the animals. Um, I think for me, that conversation, if I think about like what it's doing, I think it's partly um, just trying to describe this community of sort of happy family, diverse animals at the zoo. Um, and then it's also advertising. <laughs> look at all these different animals that the zoo has that you can come and see. Um, but it also is, is really strange. And I agree that um, it's hard to think about these articles as journalism um, because they are so divorced from 
what we would think of as the animal's experience or, or what's sort of going on with the actual animals. Yeah, Tara or Thera. Thanks for your presentation. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, so I really appreciated that you shared for um, the, the, the article on page 100, the other articles in the same issue of the newspaper, because I think it really helps understand, help, helps us understand other reasons why the newspaper is reporting on this in the first place. Um, I also work with similar kind of pulpy mass press um, newspapers in my work. And sometimes I'll just be totally confused by why any article appears and then reading for context, you get a sense. So this was helpful just as somebody coming to this from um, you know totally different uh, focus. But um, you have like in that page, you have something, there's that tiny, um, there's a lot of like familial dysfunction generally in the newspaper and you have the um, child killed by acid on the bottom right hand of the page, which is, you know, involves a mother killing her, feeding her child acid. And then, you know, the, so there's clearly a lot of moral panic about, as you were saying in your presentation about like women, unruly women, and like unfit for motherhood. Um, so I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that context in, you know, early 20th century Chicago, but also this really made me curious about how this fits into like cultural attitudes towards wet nursing during this period because I know this is like the tail end of wet nursing as a common practice um and I think that has something to do with like doctors trying to sort of medicalize motherhood but um I wonder if you could sort of address those two components of um the topic of dogs uh, suckling lions at the zoo yeah. Um, so first, the the whole page of newspaper articles um, is reflecting the, the way that ProQuest aggregates its search results. Um, so it, it's also kind of reflecting how the the research process can be kind of strange. Um, where I'll be searching for articles about the zoo, and then the the headline that shows up is the one at the top of that page. So you see the headline father accuses girl suitor and you just have to click on it and say oh maybe there's <laughs> another article on here that actually is about um the zoo um but I agree that it is um fruitful when that happens to sort of see the other articles that are appearing on the page um and I do think um it's also always interesting to see um, where in the newspaper these articles show up. So these ones are mostly buried, um, but sometimes some of these articles about animals and especially about the zookeepers maybe fighting with the animals sometimes do end up um, on the front page of the newspaper, which is also interesting context. Um, but there are a lot of sensational stories in the newspaper. Um, and there is a, a sort of lot of concern about um, women in public and also um, things like new technology. Um, so there's a, a lot of weird articles about people driving cars um, and how dangerous that might be. Um, but I think that a lot of the anxiety about um, women in particular and women's behavior shows up in the zoo in really interesting ways. So it's sort of here in the way that, um, especially the lion Emma Ames is criticized in the third article um, for being more concerned with her figure and sort of being out in public than, um, than with being a mother. That feels like a critique of modern women to me. Um, but then also in the example of the snakes getting force fed, um, there's sometimes really weird comparisons between the snakes um, not eating and um, suffragettes hunger striking. Um, so, so it does, it shows up in, in interesting ways. Um, and then I think I'm losing track of the, of the second question that you asked. Oh, just about um, wet nursing. Like how, was this a, like 
was what nursing being discussed at the same time and what terms um, and like, how do you, how, how do you analyze this story about the zoo in light of the broader cultural discourse about wet nursing? Um, okay, that's part of why I forgot that question because I don't have a ready answer to it. Um, I'm sort of just starting to think about these, these um, dogs nursing for the lions. Um, so that's something that I definitely need to do more research on. Um, but I think that for thinking about an American context and um, the sort of relationships between animalization and racialization, um, I'll definitely be wanting to go back and look at um, the sort of racial aspects of wet nursing um, and the way that might be influencing the conversation about the dog and the way the dog seem to be really valued in some ways, because unlike the lion, they're sort of doing what humans want them to do. Um, and they're also um, serving this economic role of helping to produce these lions that are um, economically valuable. So I think there's, there's something there um, in the sort of racial dynamics and the instrumentalization of the lion as like, or of the dog as like good because it's um, helping humans. Yeah. But I need to read about it more. Yeah. Um, Paul, how? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the very interesting articles also sort of gives a glimpse into a world that's uh, uh, topsy turvy. Uh, but it's, uh, but I, I was also sort of wondering, uh, or sort of reading the, the anthropomorphized article, I was sort of struck by, um, at, or at least it made me sort of wonder whether there, it almost seems as if, that, as if there's like a hierarchy to the animals and how they treat their children, because sort of, it's weird because uh, there is a tigress, so a female tiger that sort of comments, and then also the duchess, which is also sort of a female, the, the female elephant who sort of comments that it's a funny world. Uh, no dog ever shall suckle my children, which is, I don't know, it, it sort of made me wonder whether there was sort of this hierarchy of fertility or motherhood of show or something like that, um, that was sort of um, attested to or sort of placed upon these animals. But I, I don't know, have, have you come across anything like that in sort of other news articles or, or is this one of the, I, I don't know, yeah, how, how big of an <laughs> archive you have. Yeah. Um, it's a sort of difficult question. I agree there is this, yeah, judgment um, coming from the other animals. Um, the sort of strange thing about it is that the lions were more, the, the Lincoln Park Zoo was much more successful in terms of having their, getting their lions to breed and reproduce um, than I think most other animals, certainly elephants. I don't think Duchess ever had any children at the zoo, ever did reproduce at the zoo. Um, so, so the elephant is saying that, but sh she is sort of imagining these children that are the, there's many layers <laughs> of imagination yeah. in that comment by Duchess. Um, but I don't, I don't think that there, that there were any elephants the Duchess gave birth to at the zoo. Um, and the tigers, um, the tigers are, are an interesting point of contrast as well. I think also they're not reproducing to the same extent that the lions are. Um, and there's other articles where Cyrus de Bright does compare lions and tigers. Um, and he sort of makes it clear that he prefers the lions um, because the tigers are sort of too ferocious and dangerous and the lions are much nicer and more welcoming when he enters their cages. Um, so it's, it's, so it's interesting. Game. Yeah, yeah, that the lion, the tiger is standing in for sort of being more domesticated here, but in other places it's um, representing more wildness. 
Yeah, that's, it's, yeah, it's very intriguing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Anastasia. Yeah, thanks for this uh, talk and a uh, fascinating document. So, um, so I was actually reminded of the presentation that um, I gave last year at this workshop, which is on Yoko Tawada's Memoirs of a Polar Bear, um, wherein the story of Knut, the polar bear at the Berlin Zoo, is told, who was rejected by his mother and was reared and fed and nourished by, by the zookeeper. Um, so, so I didn't see any of these documents kind of taking this opportunity to make a comment on how perhaps it is the experience in captivity that may have led this uh, lioness to reject her children. So maybe that would not make for very good news and, and particularly in inspiring others to flock to the zoo to see them. Um, but, uh, but I'm wondering if there, are any fictional or, or poetic renderings of this? Because I think that would make for a, a, a fabulous um, fictionalization in the way that Tawada's work um, functions. So that's kind of one thing, like if you're aware, like has anybody transformed this into a creative work? And the second thing that really struck me, this is page 102, I believe, Lioness abandons the cubs, um, thinks more of her fine figure than of her whining babies and just how immensely sexist that whole um, article is where Emma ha has a good figure and perhaps she had read somewhere that nursing babies was not conducive to the retention of, gra of graceful lines, which now we know is actually um, demonstratively false. And if anything, nursing helps you shed those, those baby pounds. They can attest to that, um, not quickly enough, but, um, but yeah, so, so like the way that I know a feminist um, and disability studies um, kind of approach that illuminates. I mean, they don't need that. It's just so obviously sexist, right? Like um, not only ju judging of maternity, um, completely kind of disregarding. And, and I don't know, if, I mean, postpartum depression was not yet sort of like um, something that, that was commonly accepted, but but I'm, I'm sure this, you know, um, some sort of notion of maternal ambivalence was around. Um, and then just yeah, just promoting this idea of sort of the ideal body as somehow being internalized by this animal, right? Um, and being part of that rejection of her cubs. Yeah, no, those issues definitely stand out to me as well. Um, and the, and the, the connection between them too, I think is interesting. Um, in that article describing the Alliance concern for her figure, um, it, it is, I mean, so sort of ridiculously disconnected from um, the lion and it is so sexist and, and making such a clear um, critique of women. Um, but in order to do that, it, they have to completely ignore what's actually going on with the lion. Um, if you're talking about the lion um, being concerned with her figure and sort of imposing that explanation, um, then you're, you're sort of foreclosing any explanation that would be empathetic to um, why a lion in captivity might behave this way. Um, so I, yeah, I'm definitely interested in that in, in when these anthropomorphic representations get placed on these animals, they're sort of necessarily um, discounting the animal's experience and the, the way the zoo might be affecting them. Um, and I think that that, that dynamic is also really clear in the, um, again, in that anthropomorphic conversation between the animals where the, um, I think it's the polar bear, <laughs> the polar bear comments on how wonderful it is um, that because the lion is in the zoo, this dog can come in and nurse the cubs, whereas they would have died in the jungle. Um, which, which similarly is placing all of the blame on the lion and sort of explicitly saying the zoo is helping rather than harming the situation um, in a way that seems ridiculous to not consider how the zoo might be impacting the behavior. Um, so yeah, th those dynamics definitely stand out to me as well. And I haven't looked for um, creative responses to this, but that's, a, I, I really like that idea. And I would love to find, um, I would love to find something like that or more artistic commentary on the animals' lives. Um, 
yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Um, Conception. Well, uh, thank you very much for bringing the, this topic and this uh, article to us. Uh, I was very interested in reading them. And also, I was wondering, and regarding this anthropomorphizing and this tone that, uh, I don't know how, how to describe it, the um, cartoonist, um, cheeky way of uh, that these articles uh, have. Uh, well, sounds really familiar to me. I mean, I haven't looked into it. Uh, I mean, I, it's just that I, I, I've been looking at newspapers maybe in, for different reasons um, in regarding some animal topics in the 19th century, like in the middle of the 19th century, and also in the middle of the 20th century. And it seems that, well, I'm sure that there has to be, there, there have to be difference, but it seems that this kind of um, way of talking or about animals it, it seems to be well very very present across time, or at least it seems to me. So I, I don't know if someone has looked into it, but it has to be really interesting to read something about it. And it's like well this kind of maybe I was wondering it, it has to be like um, there is some place of authority to talk about animals, like from scientists or biologists, and the rest of uh, people, uh, well, maybe journalists or any other pe person that writes about animals, uh, well, just d does um, writes as, as uh, in, this, in this other sense, because they, they are not um, trying to do, uh, well, to, talk, to really talk about the animals because they are not supposed to do so. So they just do, do this kind of funny, strange thing with them, anthropomorphizing thing with them. And uh, yeah, it's something that, that I was thinking about and, and uh, feeling curious about in this sense. And, and, and then it's like, you will have like, it's like, like the written representation of many cartoons maybe that you will find in newspapers too, also with gender uh, or political things or silly things and but in, in writing, well, just some random thoughts about, about this. Yeah, thank you, that is, um helpful to know that that there is consistency <laughs> in this strange way of representing animals um and i do i do want want to compare with representations like political cartoons that are using animals um but i think so something that's really interesting about these articles is they're using that same sort of silly cartoonish tone um, but but all of the animals that they're referring to are these real actual animals so it's not sort of just a cartoon character version of an animal it's like imposing that cartoonishness onto specific animals that people can um, go and see which is I think a helpful for um, as a reminder <laughs> that the representations of animals are sort of correlated with these real actual animals. Um, so it's, a, it's helpful for me for sort of thinking about grounding the relationship between representation of animal with, with the real animals because it is so literal here. Um, Just something, well, I, the ones I was talking about were also real animals, but the the, so it was the same kind of, of cartoonist way of dealing with them. And another thing that I wanted to say and I forgot is that also got me thinking about this like um, kind of paradise uh, undertones of all the animals reunited and mm, living in a harmony together that was also uh, commented yesterday. And, and also sometimes with religious undertones and maybe this can be seen in this frame, so. Yeah, I, yeah, I think absolutely. Um, and I, and I'm interested in the idea also of, of looking more closely at, at where these um, kinds of representations of the animals are showing up relative to the, the quotes and articles by zookeepers. I think that's a really interesting point um, that maybe they're distancing themselves from the scientists or they're taking on a different tone than the scientists. Um, because there are at least 
the, the most extensive research I've done has been the Lincoln Park Zoo's newspaper coverage. Um, so there, there are articles where Cyrus de Bry kind of quotes the animals in really strange, similar ways. And then other times when he is asserting scientific authority. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that that is a good, I'm thankful for that idea as something to sort of watch out for um, the borders between the sort of scientific discussion and the more layperson representations of animals. So thank you. Yeah. Um, Gail, or hi. Um, I, I just uh, thought it'd be interesting to put it into the historical context of the way that the animals themselves were being presented at the zoo at the time, because I know in I haven't looked at um, the zoo you were looking at, but you know the whole uh, tea parties and um, monkey, you know, monkey tea parties and and chimpanzees driving those little cars. Uh, did that happen at Lincoln Park Zoo where they had the, the kind of dodgems and things? So there, I think that one aspect of it is that the animals um, are already, the real animals are already being presented as um, a, a co comedy act and they're kind of like seen as performers and that kind of concept of respect or dignity is sort of in the, in the literature I've looked at really starts to creep in in the 60s where people start going, oh, I'm a bit uneasy with these, you know, is this natural, is this the natural dignity of the animal? But before that, it's like, you know, these kinds of, um, you know, comic presentations of animals um, as their zoo performance or, or mode is, is quite common. And... Um, I guess the other thing too that I found quite fascinating was that blurring the boundary between the wild and the domestic um, and, and that kind of, um, you know, is, is really interesting in that this kind of specific example too, I think. So, yeah, just if you've got any comments on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm also really interested in um, both of those things. I think um, I want to make sure I... <laughs> remember to talk about both. Um, so yeah, there are the sort of animal performances at Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, they tend to start happening a little bit later than this. Um, and it's usually with the monkeys in the zoo. Um, so the, the monkeys are, are performing these sort of tea parties um, and other kinds of um, anthropomorphic, they're being trained to do these anthropomorphic performances. Um, I haven't seen instances of it happening with the lion. So some of these lions would have been coming maybe from circuses or sold to circuses where they would have been trained to sort of go through these specific routines. Um, but the way the lions are sort of being presented, interacting with um, humans is always tends to be sort of these sort of real interactions that are part of their care. Um, so the lions are, are one of the animals that often are in the newspaper because Cyrus DeVry is going into their cages for various reasons and kind of wrestling with them because he needs to move them from one cage to another or because he needs to clean a wound or, or care for them in some way. Um, so, so they're less anthropomorphized in, in other kinds of ways that they're appearing in public. Um, and then I'm also really interested in that um, dynamic between the dog as a sort of domesticated animal and the lion. Um, because I think it, it is interesting to think about how people viewed pets differently as sort of good domesticated civilized animals. Um, and the way that zoo animals often get referred to as pets by the zookeepers. Um, and there also are references to the idea that the zoo is a place where the, the animals are civilized and that's a, a sort of good positive thing, um, which is maybe also evidenced by the monkey tea parties. Um, so I'm interested in thinking about how this dog nursing plays into that process uh, of sort of domesticating these animals. Um, but it gets a little bit 
tricky because the <laughs> when the lion is really villainized, um, it feels like she's also being negatively compared with a different kind of civilized woman. So it's not- on the, other, on the other hand, we can see her as the diva, can't we? Um, you know, that it's very explicit. And the diva is a, an interesting figure because she's not exactly, you know, she, she's, she's, she's worshiped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's different kinds yeah. of women here, but um, I, yeah, I agree. Um, I'm, I'm interested in those dynamics as well. Right, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, Kari? I just, well, I, um, two things. I want to acknowledge the fact that Laura has joined oh. us. Um, and so we should move on. But I also wanted to, uh, before we do that, what was I gonna say? Well, I mean, I, I think, I just think this is a really interesting case study in how comp right we tend to think about oh there's anthropomorphism and we all know what that is but actually the way that it works anthropomorphism zoomorphism that you know also i'm pretty sure that the film and opera divas of, of the time or i know for a fact are also compared to tigers and lions and uh, and so on and at the same time the lion is um you know, we heard yesterday with Cecil Rhodes and uh, and so on. I think maybe it doesn't have to be anthrop the male line, especially doesn't have to be anthropomorphized to the same extent because it's it's supposed to, it, it the symbolic function depends on it being a wild animal, in contrast to chimpanzees who are kind of like you know funny people who can drive around in cars and whatever. Incidentally, the chimpanzees probably love driving around in cars. This is you know I'm I'm assuming the enrichment was uh, was pretty uh, anyway. Um, and I think, anyway, I think around this time also there's all kinds of really interesting things going on with with lions and zoos. Mussolini, uh, a few years later, would have uh, would adopt would become the father of a lion cub, and this the fact that he was uh, nursing this lion cub was sort of a symbol of how uh, virile he was, and uh, and so on. Anyway, there's a whole I can there's a whole series of books you could write about this. Uh, so I hope that you will pursue this, uh, pursue this, uh, this further. Um, but uh, in the uh, in view of the time, I would like to um, invite Laura to take the stage. Welcome, uh, Laura. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely mortified that I'm so late. I got AM and PM mixed up. Is that pathetic? I'm so, so mortified. So um, please, please excuse me. And I'm so glad I got to see as much of your of your talk as, as I did, Margaret. That's really, really, really interesting stuff. I, um, I've been working on dogs and wolves for several years now, probably about a decade, I think. Um, now almost. And so I, I've decided I'm going to turn my attention a little bit to taxidermy. I know there's so much out there. And so I'm hoping, because this is so new for me, that a lot of you will, will give me feedback and some directions and places to go and things to think about, because there is just such a wealth of material. Um, and so if I can share my screen, I thought I would just run through this PowerPoint really quickly, um, just to have some images to, to talk about together. If I can make this bigger, there we go. And I can go like that. It's being very slow. Um, so it seems to me that there are a lot of different ways in which wolves are shown. And I think I have to preface all of this by saying, you know, I live in the West. I live in a place in which um, well, people either love or hate wolves. And there's a constant battle going on about if they're going to survive at all, because there's just so much, um, there's so much pressure on the land and um, preserving or not preserving the land that they need in which to survive. And so you see them in all sorts of different places. I mean, they are a species that I think came very, very close to going extinct and still could easily. Um, a lot of things that have happened in the past year have been really, really bad for them. So um, it's interesting to look at how they're currently represented, but how they've been represented over time. And um, let me move this forward. Come on, go. 
Okay. So one of the things that has been so interesting is looking at dioramas and the way that wolves are shown in dioramas. And it is, as you would expect, I guess, basically they look um, vicious. They're in packs. They're in wilderness, wild, wild landscapes. Um, I, I love this photo. I love I love these kids looking at these wolves. And it's interesting because they're looking at the back of the wolves, right, as the wolves are moving forward. But in the American Museum of Natural History, this diorama that was recently redone is um, they come right towards you. So they're, the impression is much more um, terrifying. I think it's meant to be more terrifying. Um, they seem like they're on the trail of something. If you're interested, there is a fantastic video of them redoing this diorama, which happened very recently. And the snow shadows are actually um, colored pulverized marble. That's how they make them. I, it was the most amazing thing. I've showed it to my students because I just thought it was incredible to see how they were doing that because there are six different light sources, but to unify them as the appearance of a single light source, that's how they do it, which is, is great. But I mean, the wolves are, um, it's strange, right? Because they're, there's this wolf dog thing, right? And we, we love dogs, we're familiar with dogs, we know dogs. And so there, there's this tension, I think, in trying to distinguish the wolf from the dog. And I have an article that recently came out about that, about the wolf and the dog and home. And I think that the wolf is always set in the wilderness, right? That's one way to distinguish it, to make sure that it's a, it's not a dog, it's a wolf, because you want to make sure you know sort of it as the enemy as opposed to the friend. There's this very strange tension there, and I think these dioramas try very hard to sort of play along that line, to, 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 to define this, to make it clear. I wanted to bring in this thing from the American Museum of Natural History's website and at the end where it's, it talks about wolf populations rebounding. This is new, right? Um, it's evident they don't need pristine wilderness to survive. With enough prey and protection, wolves can easily adapt to other areas. But that idea goes both ways, right? That um, uh -oh, wolves could be everywhere. They could be in your neighborhood. They could be anywhere. And those of you who have, if you have a dog that looks even the littlest bit like a wolf, you will know that people are like, is that a wolf? Like they'll, they'll say that to you all the time. There is this great tension of, and wolf dogs bring in their own sets of problems. Um, Mission Wolf is, um, they're based in Colorado and these are sort of awful photos, but it's from their website and it shows kind of them taking their wolves out on parade, right? They, they take them to high schools, they take them to high school gyms and people meet them and here, it, it looks an awful lot like a dog, right? It's on a leash, it's, you know, and it's it's very, very friendly. And I've visited Mission Wolf and they do have these, what they call ambassador wolves that you can meet that are very, very dog-like, right? Um, and, and they do present them in that way. If you look at what wolf sanctuaries are doing, um, they try to, they show them always as like sort of lone wolves quite a bit. Um, or in packs, like his families, and very, very friendly um, or beautiful, um, but they're in these very enclosed areas that seem very not wild, um, and they're not wild. So you can see what Mission Wolf looks like, what its sanctuary looks like, it's, you see the houses, teepees, all of that, um, and the wolves, you can see the chain link fence really clearly. Um, there are other sanctuaries around, and I think this image on the right is kind of perfect, right? It's sort of dog-like, right? I mean, they, they, they push them towards this edge of, of being dog-like as opposed to wolf-like. Um, and I just kind of want to end because these endangered Mexican wolves, there are very, very few of them now. And uh, lots of groups are, are trying to save them. But you see them in the zoo here and it's this family. They show them as a family unit. Uh, and that's the other way in which you see this. And so there's this kind of this tension, I think, that is there that all of these different vehicles like social media or the places that you go to see them or the images that you see on the internet are all kind of playing with. Um, and the last thing is things like these wildlife safaris where you pay huge amounts of money. I mean, if you look, it's $6,400 for three days 
to go see wolves in Jackson Hole and really they're in Yellowstone. Um, and there they play up this idea of the wilderness, right? It's all about the wilderness and how you're going to go out there uh, and spend all this money. This whole idea, I think, is a very complicated, very troubled idea. And it embodies, to me, all of the ways in which wolves are being shown or have been shown, the, the problematic elements of distinguishing the wolf from the dog. And I guess I'm sort of looking for feedback and direction from, from all of you about sort of ways to think about sort of taxidermies, dioramas, zoos, all of that in terms of what you've all done um, and sort of what your thoughts are about this as well. And see, as you can see, I'm not kidding when I talk about it being unformed and very new. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm still just mesmerized by your uh, your automatic captioning. I couldn't. Uh, I That's weird, <laughs> isn't it? I don't know how to turn that off. It's really, oh, but, and it's often bonkers, right? It's oh, like, but uh, I was really impressed by it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> sorry. That's that's not a comment on uh, on your presentation at all. But I just I hadn't seen that uh, seen that. I before. have to figure out how to turn it off. It's really weird. If I may start with just, um, so these are impressions and observations that I have. And also um, I love wolves. My first article in animal studies was on the figure of the werewolf, teen wolf okay. specifically, um, is this kind of transitional figure. Um, the very first book that made me cry as a child was Call of the Wild. Uh -huh. um, so so the, the figure of the wolf has been haunting me quite literally since I was eight. Um, and I find it to be a very ambiguous figure because on the one hand, I mean, I, I one of the first presentations I made in second grade was that we need to save the wolf. Um, <laughs> yeah. But there's a lot of cultural messaging, right, that that sets them up as as one of these apex predators. Um, right. I'm thinking there's a local zoo in Fargo called the Red River Valley Zoo. They have a special event where you can buy tickets to watch the two white wolves devour a freshly killed deer. And this is like a family friendly event um, that Yay. also inspired a lot of wild <laughs> photographers to come and you know capture them. Finally, yeah. the wolves are doing yeah. something interesting, right? Um, and then when I went horse raiding um, up in um, East Washington, you know, the older ranchers talking about the wolves as being a nuisance because they, mm -hmm. they prey on the cattle. So, yeah. so how do you navigate that, you know? Um, how do you how do you argue for conserving wolves where they all all of this you know messaging presenting them as as villainous? Well, and and it's interesting, right? Because all of it's reinforcing something, Anastasia. So, like, um, I was recently on a call about wolves in Colorado because you know the voters voted last year to bring wolves back, and I said, well, I'm in Utah. You know, can we do that? Could we do a ballot initiative? And one of the legal experts said, no, because you would have to change the constitution. The state constitution bans wolves. How can you ban a wild animal, okay? And so I looked to see like, well, when did that happen? Is that like 1884? It happened last year and it was in response to Colorado just to make sure that we wouldn't get any ideas and try to bring wolves back too. So, I mean, and it's bizarre, like the idea that you would have our, these boundaries, right? This sort of strange shape and no, they're not allowed in. But then you look at all the things reinforcing that idea. And I see, um, you know, hunt, the hunters here would love to kill wolves, right? I mean, I think that if they brought them back that would be the reason is so these guys can kill wolves. And, you know, we have coyotes, like I'll hear coyotes in the mountain right behind us. And every time I hear them, I think, oh no, like they'll get rid of them. You know, I, always, I wish that I could like put little muzzles on them so they won't say anything, you know? It's a very strange thing to live in a place where people would just as soon kill them as look at them and, um, and think about why, right? Because they like their dogs, but they don't like these. Um, and so it's, it's, it's so powerful, you know, like you said, it's so powerful and it's in myth, it's um, in religion, it's in the Bible, it's everywhere. And so it's, um, it's and, and the fact that it's continuously reinforced through imagery is, is fascinating to me. 
hard battle. Yeah, yeah. Meron? Yeah, Meron. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the difference between the American perspective or North American, I should say, um, and like a European perspective on wolves. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in the Netherlands and, and um, there's this constant sort of media tension about whether the wolf is going to come back uh -huh. to the Netherlands. Um, and then there's sightings and there's like pictures. It's kind of like Bigfoot in a way. Um, mm -hmm. This is always like the wolf has reappeared, but then it gets hit by a car and it dies. Yeah. Um, and then everybody's really sad and then like, three months later there's another one it's so it's very interesting that they're so uncommon they used yeah. to be in the Netherlands and then they're now they're sort of coming back they're coming from Germany um and it's and the discourse around it is really interesting because people find it uh so cool that we're like going back to the way that we were like oh the wolf is like um that's like primitive nature i guess yeah, for yeah. the netherlands yeah so then we're getting this old predator back but at the same time you've got a lot of people who have um herds of sheep for example they're very upset about it and they want it to be shot and right. just like this whole thing but it's interesting they're so uncommon in the netherlands that the discourse is totally different um around them they're like uh rare goods and we really want them but we also don't but they're so cool, you know? I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, there's something, the one, the place that I was, I did a Fulbright in the UK and that was really interesting because mm -hmm. they killed all their wolves a long time ago and there's no way they're coming back unless they bring them back, right? Because they, yeah, they can't yeah. swim that far. And so, um, and the last one was in Scotland. And so it's all this stuff, right? There's this romance about the wolf. Um, and there's a lot of rewilding efforts, right? Like lots of rewilding efforts. And I'm curious if the Dutch don't want to rewild. They'll, if it came back, it would be okay, but there's no rewilding efforts like to bring them back to Holland. I'm not entirely sure, actually. Okay. But I do think that it's it's um, it's been something that they're trying to do to make it come back. Any Dutch people that can, I'm looking at Pau, because he can, maybe uh -huh. he can confirm that, because I think every time to, it gets yeah. reported, yeah, it's kind of like a, it worked, it's coming back, you know, and then it gets hit by a car. It's really ironic, but I'm kind of sad. Yeah. There was just recently, there was an article about about the, how the wolf is, they think that the wolf is now, or wolves are permanently back in uh, in the Netherlands. And if left to their own devices and not, they don't get run over by cars. Right? There was some unbelievable, you know, at the moment there are, you know, three wolf families or whatever that seem to or whatever packs uh mm -hmm. family groups that that are, uh, are are living here seem to be living here permanently and not just moving through mm -hmm. and they had they interviewed some expert and he said yes but you know the netherlands would technically have room for two thousand right and it's like okay i'm not sure what version of the netherlands you live in but but that article was that article was was really i really eye-popping i think also just uh the the status of the wolf as a, as a kind of as an idea is so powerful as you know the enemy of man and the the thing that we can never tame but at the same time it's so cool and so you you know you go and you, you, all of the dog food has pictures of wolves on it because you know if you're a real man then you will feed your dog like actual beef and whatever the traditional food category animal of uh, of canines yeah um and um but also speaking of right, there are so many dogs in 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 the Netherlands, and and all of these farmers are worried. Oh, but if we have wolves, then 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 they're going to eat all of our sheep. But on average, there's something like I don't know. The last last year, there were two sheep, or you know, a handful yeah. that that were that were killed by wolves, whereas there were like fifteen thousand that were killed by dogs. Yeah. Right. But nobody talks about this. Yeah. I'm making these statistics, but it was astronomical. Like the difference was yeah. unbelievable, right? But of course, nobody is saying, "Oh my God, we have to we have to ban dogs, or we have to shoot them all, or we have to uh, change the constitution to make sure that yeah. we can't have dogs because they're dangerous for our livestock." So it's it's actually it doesn't really have anything to do with facts. It only has to do with the the kind of cultural uh, mm -hmm. status of, uh, of 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 the of the wolf. Yeah, and you know, the, the wolves are doing so much cultural labor, like so much, it's exhausting for them. You know, you, you think about it, and you think, I can't believe what the burden on these animals, you know? Um, the other, I would say like related to sort of what you're talking about, Kari, is like in, in the States, we have all these public lands, like I'm surrounded by public lands, but they're used for private profit. So you have these ranchers that just let uh, their cows 
go on this land all summer and then they but they don't want any threat to them like they're they, you can't have any wolves there because they might kill a cow and the thing is what the cow what the wolves would prefer is actually you know deer or natural some you know something that's an, an actually what they would naturally eat um and and it's it's a really really um problematic thing right i think private profit off public lands is already a problem but then using it to create the sort of further kind of um ecological disaster is is really really bad so i'm sorry how you've had your 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 electronic hand raised for ages that's okay it's uh, it's an interesting conversation so it's nice also to just listen but uh uh yeah no i i, I sort of took because i was also sort of as to sort of all the, the the cultural lifting that the wolf does it was also i recently also read an article which sort of uh commented on sort of the idea of the that wolves are led by the by an alpha and a, mm -hmm. and a beta sort of and that this idea also sort of spread through well science but also sort of in in the the, the business vocabulary sort of that right. you have to be the alpha male and uh, and this article also sort of explained that this was actually based on false evidence, or at least sort of the, um, uh, the, the research was done on wolves in captivity with larger groups and that there would be fighting and an alpha male. But in actuality, like in the wild, it would just be a family and yeah. there would just be the parents who were sort of, but by that point, it was already too late. And sort of this idea indeed of the wolf as sort of this masculine, yeah, like, well, like how we said with the dog food, like this, yeah, sort of the, the semantics surrounding it had already gone too far to actually sort of, uh, yeah, to be able to, to, to reel it in, in a sense. Yeah. But I thought yeah. that was also really weird. And, and I also had like a, a second point. Sorry, I don't really have any question, but just. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, because your comment on sort of also the, the, the these, these human borders and also sort of the coyote also make me think of that there are now these hybrids, I think, mm -hmm. sort of between wolves and coyotes and how there is sort of also this ecological effort or uh, to save the wolf <laughs> as yeah. in that it's it's supposed to be pure and not mingle with, right? which is, I don't know, it's that, that's, and I was like, uh, I was also wondering sort of indeed with the wolf dog and the sort of these other animals, because those also sort of occupy this weird liminal position between mm -hmm. sort of wild and not pure, but it, I don't know, it, as a species that invokes a lot of interesting questions. <laughs> it does, it does, yeah. I agree. And the, the coyote wolf is a whole sort of separate thing, right? Um, because coyotes are always um, referred to as nuisance, right? Like wolves aren't a nuisance, but a coyote is a nuisance. And I don't know, why? I, I don't know if it's because they're smaller. I'm not sure exactly. I haven't really looked at closely at them because I think I'm I'm so concerned about them since I can hear them that I'm like, I don't, I don't think I could bear to, to read more about like horrible things happening to them. But um, but they, that Kiowa thing is interesting and the wolf dog thing is also interesting. And there are sanctuaries, lots of sanctuaries that are specifically just for those wolf dogs. There's lots of, um, there are lots of breed specific legislations out there that will not allow them to live in various places. I would say them and pit bulls are the two, the dog breed that, um, that a lot of racist stuff applies to a lot of racist policies. And so they are really sort of painted with this broad brush of, you know, you can't have them and, and they can't live here and they can't live there. So it's very, very problematic. It's it's definitely um, a huge problem. So, Concepcion. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not really aware of the, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm from Europe, I'm, I'm in Spain. So I don't, I'm not really familiar from the United States context, but I also can't talk about how things are in Spain yeah, yeah. Uh, right now. and. Uh, and it, um, it, it, in fact, it, it uh, in September this year, uh, it was officially banned to hunt wolves here in Spain, uh, and it's has been an ongoing, really long uh, debate about uh, uh, wolves and hunting wolves and the damages they causes uh, to cattle and the things that were you were mentioning also, and also the, for the. Um, Last years, they have, well, the wolf, wolves were always in the north of Spain. 
but uh, last year they have been coming uh, down south. So it's uh, more common uh, now to see them uh, like in the center or in the south of the uh, Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and and when it's well, it's been yeah, I, I don't know the, the situation has been cha change, changing a lot in the um, and in this sense, but there is still a lot of tensions with uh, because uh, people say that they will eat their cattle, mm -hmm. but uh, it, there is a, that this thing about maybe they are they are not the wolves, they are like wild dogs uh, doing that, uh, and uh, and also like. Um, in the past, there were uh, these kind of auctions to kill wolves. Uh, unfortunately, we got rid of those, and now it's really banned to hunt wolves. But still, there is um, things going on, like uh, because uh, some people is not happy about the situation. They will do things like uh, hunting a wolf illegally and putting the, the head of the wolf at in some uh, like some symbolic place, like a protest. Like, so it brings also again this kind of primeval kind of behaviors uh, uh, with very, very rooted, like in, you were saying, uh, literature, uh, history, and with religious maybe connotation. connotation. And also is there's, it, there's, yes? Is it political as well? Does it go uh, to politics or is it more related to sort of literature? Uh, the the thing about the putting the wolf head, it's uh -huh. it's like a, it's it it was framed up as a protest concerning yeah. uh, the the damage to, the wolves were doing to the cattle. So like okay. and they would put that like in a very I think they put the head once like in the middle of a bridge, mm. uh, that, and it was it got uh, a, a medieval bridge so it was like quite a uh, yeah quite and it got all the press. Yeah. What was going around it, but it, yeah. it, it came across like a, such a well violent, but very also primeval kind of thing, yeah. like the human yeah. dog uh, war or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's it's super. It's everywhere, right? Everywhere yeah. these poor things are. It's, yeah, yeah. And another it's thing is about the thing that they try and also to recover mastiffs uh, mm. with around cattle. Because uh, the problem is, they uh, they got rid of the mastiffs in some places in Spain. So that's uh, when they have are having more problem with wolves. But in the places that they kept the mastiffs, well, there is a mastiff uh, wolf uh, antagonism going on. So they won't attack the cattle that is uh, guarded by mastiffs. So another thing mm -hmm. is trying to recover the mastiffs. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you, Calista. Um, at some point, I will, if it's okay, Kari, I'll send my, um, that article that just came out about, um, about the wolf and the dog and the home, home and not home. So it came out in a journal of sort of a special issue about animals in the home. <laughs> I would love any wolf poem you wanna send me. I will take any wolf poem you've got. So. Uh, Laura. I wondered if you were interested in the work of Matthew Barney. Do you know his, he's an American artist? Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, so I haven't actually had a chance to, I mean, I haven't seen the, the work, but I know he's done this recent video about um, a sort of wolf hunting um, where he's, I, I, as I understand it, I've only read articles about it, so I don't, can't really tell you. It looks amazing, but um he's sort of hunting wolves and there's um, kind of women hunting him and, you know, it all takes place in this snowy landscape. Um, yeah, so that in terms of if you're interested in different ways of imagining the image of the wolf, I think that that um, artwork might be really interesting to you. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. I, it's funny because I sort of, this is going to be so bitchy. I sort of avoid him, you know, because he's so um, 
over like there's so much of him Ugh. yeah yeah but um but it's on your topic he's, he's on your topic. Yes. <laughs> i know i know i know and it's but it's don't you think he's sort of taking off from just the boys with that though right with the the coyote in the gallery i mean it seems like he's sort of ripping off joseph boys um but yeah i'll um i but no that's a great suggestion i mean obviously charlie yeah. no, no. No. Yeah. you're right you're right thank you so anything any other things because i know we're up against the time right kari i don't want to Yes, sorry. I just had uh, my um, my mouse. Uh, my computer lost control, lost contact with my mouse, and so now I can't use my computer. So I had to join the meeting <laughs> on my iPad, uh, and I have no idea how to stop the recording or anything because I can't um, I can't get it to communicate. I'm so um, over technology. I can't even. Um, but yes, we um, we should. We should try to stop here also so that I can try and get things working again in time for the keynote. Um, so now I'm in the meeting twice and hello. Um, <laughs> uh, this is this is all very interesting. Um, well, are there any final final comments? Um, is that the meeting on your phone? Yes. Okay, I'll do that. Thanks, Andrew. That's very helpful. Um, <laughs> Do you have a specific video in mind? This is the thing. Uh, I'm living under a rock and I haven't been watching many music videos, but it's tickling uh -huh. your talk. There's something that's like starting to be dislodged at the back of my head. And if I find it, um, I'll let you know. But it wouldn't surprise me that there are a bunch of wolves in recent music videos. There are a lot of big exotic animals. Um, and so, yeah, if I it's do end up finding a title, they'll come in yeah. with the poems. Because there's so many songs, right? Like you'll be listening to something and all of a sudden you're just like, oh my God, this is a wolf song. This is a wolf song. You know, there's so many uh, in every possible genre. It's so funny, you know, and, and, and unless you're looking and paying attention and focusing, you wouldn't ever think about them as, as one sort of giant blob of them but um yeah that's a great suggestion let me i'll think about that for sure it looks like you just got a really good one in the chat yeah awesome thank you a eurovision winner that's fantastic i'm always yeah, it's actually dance with the wolves not dancing with the wolves but, okay um, yeah it's really it's it's wonderful i recommend it awesome okay maybe that's a good oh wait am i still no i'm not muted um, maybe that's a good place to end it here um, for the moment. Um, this, the, this minor technological mishap may mean that we don't end up having a recording of this, uh, of this session, but we were all here and we had a great time. So that's, uh, that's what matters. Um, don't forget to download the chat, everybody, um, before you leave, because that will disappear into the ether when I have to restart my computer now. Um, and uh, if I can do that. And uh, thank you uh, to everybody. Laura, I'm glad that you found your way to us uh, eventually. I, I hope. Uh, no, it lost, con lost contact with my keyboard as well. So. I'm totally, uh, I'm flying blind. Well, I, I, I can see what's going on, but I have no control over anything. Um, anyway, so I will try and sort this out and, uh, and I will see you all back here in, uh, in 20 minutes for the keynote. Okay.